this fourth in a series of kitchen table dialogues on the future of work and workers, reflections and insights from the Canadian labor movement. My name's Gord Cunningham, and I'm the executive director of the Cody Institute and Extension Department here at St. Francis Xavier University in Nova Scotia, Canada. I'm here to welcome you all on behalf of my colleague, Jamie Smith, who heads our Cody's uh, social innovation area and is the executive lead of our Center for Employment Innovation. She'll hopefully be able to join us a little bit later in the webinar. A really special welcome to the 31 change leaders from 12 countries who were enrolled in Cody's first ever course on the future of work and workers. And these are a great mix of folks uh, from organizations and communities, as I say, around the globe and right here in, in Nova Scotia. The future of work is a phrase we're hearing over and over in many, many circles. But when you add and workers to that phrase, it implies a worker-centered lens to this discussion, which I'm after really delighted to see. Our university's extension department, along with the Cody Institute, have a long history of promoting a citizen-led and collective action approach to community development. And it weaves through many movements, the cooperative movement, the women's movement, and the labor movement. Before we begin the actual proceedings of this webinar, though, I want to make an official acknowledgement, which we call the land acknowledgement, but I think it's much more than that. The Cody Institute at St. Francis Xavier University is physically located in Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. The territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship with Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples, first signed with the British Crown way back in 1725. These treaties, which were really considered nation-to-nation -nation agreements, uh, did not surrender the lands and resources of this place and recognize Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be a, a healthy, ongoing relationship between nations. On this webinar today, we have people from all over the globe, and I'd like to ask each of you for a few seconds to reflect on the Indigenous peoples of the lands in which you reside, your own country's history of colonization, and potential pathways of reconciliation which um, are either underway or could be undertaken. Our university and indeed our country are in the early stages of a process of reconciliation with our Indigenous peoples. But we still have a long way to go. Before I hand over the stick to my colleagues Yogesh and, and Farouk, Yogesh Gore and Farouk Jiwa who will be facilitating this webinar, I want to thank the province of Nova Scotia their support's been instrumental in making this webinar series possible. And now a quick word about your facilitators today. Yogesh Gore leads Cody's Inclusive Economies area, which he has for more than a decade. And Farouk Jiwa, who is a serial social entrepreneur and experienced development practitioner, has worked hand in hand with Yogesh every step of the way. Yogesh? Thank you. Thank you, uh, God, for uh, that wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, thank you for your, your leadership as well in, in letting us explore these new areas and, and start these initiatives like the course as well as the series of webinars. I think it's about time we talk about uh, the future of work. In the same format, uh, Moses Cody started uh, uh, almost, uh, almost 100 years back. Uh, it's a pleasure, uh, uh, Danny, uh, to welcome you. Uh, uh, Danny, uh, as, as the president uh, of the Nova Scotia Federation of uh, Labor, uh, please welcome uh, to, uh, to the webinar. You know, uh, Danny, you have over 35 years of experience uh, with, the, with the labor movement. Uh, and, and we are going to talk about the history and also the contemporary issues. But first, I, I, I want you to uh, just tell us uh, uh, your story, how you got associated with the, with the labor movement. Okay, sure. And uh, thanks, everybody, for... Um, allow me to participate with you. I just am um, totally amazed that we have 31 participants from all over the globe who are change makers. And, you know, many of us in the labor movement here in Nova Scotia champion to be change makers ourselves. So everything that we can do, uh, no matter where we sit in which country around the globe, we all, I think, want to see some positive change, change uh, that values um, the beliefs that we all have as workers. So um, here in Nova Scotia, I got involved in the uh, union movement as a municipal worker back in, uh, back in 1980, actually. Um, 
uh, was involved with the uh, union there right away. There was many people in our workplace uh, that didn't have a high degree of education. Um, so we, so we kind of I got involved. Um, nobody in our workplace had ever filed a grievance uh, previous to that. So we um, started filing some grievances on different things. And uh, so I moved up and, uh, be, uh, you know, many different positions within the local union, including um, becoming its president um, and a number of other positions. I uh, then got involved provincially with our union. It was a Canadian union of public employees at the time. Um, so I was a member of CUP Local 734. It was a long, um, older established local union from the Canadian Union of Public Employees, which is a national organization. Um, and then I uh, became the president of CUPE. So CUPE is an acronym for the Canadian Union of Public Employees. Currently today, it has about 700,000 members nationally across the country here. And uh, they have about 18,000, I believe, here in Nova Scotia. So I became the provincial president of CUPE and I served as the provincial president for QP for around 10 years, I believe, it might've been 12. I just forget exactly what the numbers are. And, um, and then in that role, and then um, back in 2015, I became the president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor. Uh, and I've been democratically elected um, in subsequent years since 2015. So all unions really are, you know, they advocate for uh, the good of the people in general. Uh, the Federation of Labor's mandate is around making sure we are change makers for changing different laws and regulations. We do a number of, uh, you know, some work around uh, people's occupational health and safety of members, but um, some other things as well. Uh, unions, I know, typically are governed by their constitutions, their bylaws, and other regulations. I like to say that we're more, uh, have more democracy than uh, many governments do, um, you know, and, and like I said, we're elected, people are elected, and, you know, we have to follow the whims and wishes of the membership that we, that we represent. So we're always, every two years, I have to go to a convention and uh, get elected at, uh, at that convention. So that's kind of a, a, a brief history about my background. I've, um, you know, nationally with CUPE, I've also been um, instrumental in getting their environment committee up and running and I've uh, done um, some work around literacy. So we established the first ever uh, CUPE National Literacy Committee. I just finished being the chair of Literacy Nova Scotia which is a provincial organization. So I was chair of that for about six years, I believe as well, while, while we're doing this work. So um, you know, I have a number of irons and different fires all over the place. I'm not an expert in anything, but I do have a bit of history, so. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful, Danny. Uh, and, and it's good that you started with the history. Uh, and, and there will be more questions, I think. And, and when we open the floor, I'm sure the, the participants will have more questions. But you know, I, I, I wanted to begin with the, with the current moment. I mean, you have, you have a long history, but you know, the crisis that we are currently hit with, it's very unprecedented in many ways. So can you just talk about how the COVID actually hit you and, and, and how the, the union um, has looked at that, how it has uh, responded. So just, just thoughts on that. Sure, no, um, so the COVID like everywhere, you know, it um, started here in March. We actually um, shut our office down on the 17th of March uh, because of COVID. I will say here in the Atlantic region though in Nova Scotia, um, we've been more fortunate than what we're seeing either across Canada and, you know, some other countries about uh, how COVID had hit people. Uh, currently, you know, we have, I think, only three cases here in Nova Scotia currently when we see in other provinces in Canada, you know, with cases skyrocketing every day. So we're a bit nervous. We're a bit nervous around that. But, you know, it was very, it was devastating, even though we had limited number of cases in Nova Scotia, but it was still devastating when you know, businesses had to shut down and restaurants had to shut down and, 
you know, filmmakers and all those different kind of businesses that we have all shut down. So it affected a number of workers, uh, mostly, I would say, in Nova Scotia, in the private sector, um, even those that were unionized, but, but of course, non-unionized places as well. We didn't see a huge number of workers uh, lose their jobs, but we did have some, mainly in the film industry. So some of the lo locals like Ayatsu, um, you know, they kind of shut down because there was no work that was happening for them. Um, some other some other workplaces um, lost, you know, had to stop work. So that was that was that was a bit of a problem. You know, and the big thing, I guess, coming out of COVID is we want to make sure that we have, you know, some things that get put in place to make life better for workers. I think it was, you know, when in Canada, the government decided to put in the uh, the STIR benefit. So it was a bit of a, a people could collect money because they lost their job up to $500 a week under the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Which is which is the SERB benefit that that needed to last longer than it had for workers over the um, two months or three months that the government put that in. So we um, you know we advocated as a trade union movement for some changes to the unemployment system. So people that were still today um, out of work would have some sort of an income. And I think there's um, a valid point around. Um, that income, because what often gets lost in much of the discussion is about if workers don't have a paycheck and they can't contribute to the economy, then there is no economy. So if people don't have a paycheck, they can't spend money in their restaurants, they can't spend money in businesses, and when they, when they can't spend money, then those businesses fail. So it's very important, you know, that we had a government that stepped up to the plate and provided those benefits for workers. They helped some businesses with uh, wage subsidies and different programs. I think the caution for us is as change makers is we don't want to see government start and impose an austerity agenda, meaning going back to, you know, that uh, the um, corporatization, the corporate world that we often lived in in the past where you know, the economics of that um, was good for the rich corporations and rich people, but workers didn't fare out so well under, under, that kind of, under that kind of thinking. And we've seen that, you know, over the last 25 years, you know, not, not just here in Nova Scotia, but in Canada, where it's been devastating for workers. Workers are struggling. There's many people that work in precarious work. They don't have any benefits. You know, when it comes time to retire, they got limited income. So there's all those things I think that play into the into the whole thing. So I guess to just to bring us back to the COVID stuff is that what we want to see now as we start to come out of COVID in in many places is to make sure that the recovery is going to be good for workers and benefits workers at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and to some of the participants uh, who are not from Canada, I think uh, in Canada, as soon as the uh, lockout was declared sometime in, in March, uh, the government ca came up with a, with a package, it's called SERB, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, uh, which allowed all the workers who has lost their jobs to get $500 per week of payment. And that lasted for for some two months, uh, three months, depending on uh, when they got the job back. Uh, uh, so in, in terms of like uh, your work, uh, uh, Danny, uh, the, uh, there's, there's some folks who, who got benefited from, from SERP, but there might be uh, cases where uh, people lost uh, uh, job as well. And, and, uh, and, and so how long the, the SERP lasts uh, or, or is, there, is there some more work that, that you are involved in, in terms of reemployment? Uh, of the folks that who have, who have lost job? Well, I think, yeah, that's part of what the kind of Canadian labor movement is now uh, fighting for is those changes to the EI system to make sure that there's something there for workers. So in the Atlantic region in Nova Scotia, there's many people that work as an example in seasonal work. Uh, the reason they work in seasonal work is because we have seasonal industries. And a lot of people like to, you know, call them seasonal workers when they're only seasonal workers because they're seasonal industries 
in their communities and that's what keeps people in their communities when they when they try to you know um, have jobs in the, in the seasonal industry that's in their community so many of those people you know through covid had suffered so as an example many people that may work in a in the food industry in a restaurant in the local community um, over the summer months when tourists were you know coming to nova scotia you know the hotel industry and and you know those kinds of things fish plants uh, would be another good example so some of those types of work you know there wasn't any tourism really because nobody could get into atlantic canada and to nova scotia um, over the past number of months, which has been devastating, you know, for those businesses, but more importantly for those workers and the and the local economy in those communities, because when people don't have a paycheck, then they're not spending any money, and uh, there's all kinds of problems that arise from, you know, when people are living in in, you know, really poverty kind of situations that's been brought about because of COVID. So. Our work around the employment insurance stuff, I think, where they've reduced the hours now to 120 hours and they've upped it from $400 a week and maintained the $500 a week that people can collect on unemployment are all important aspects. But we need to do more. We need to make sure people are going to be protected for as long as they can. We need to make sure that the economy is driven because people have paychecks and they're getting the help that they need to get from the government. And, I, you know, I think sometimes when, you know, we hear from um, those people that promote the austerity kind of stuff and, you know, we just can't see people kicked out onto the streets kind of stuff. But we need to think about, you know, what's the reverse of that? What happens if the government doesn't look after people or nobody's looking after the people? Then we'll have, you know, massive shutdowns of the economy. Businesses will go under. People will lose their homes. Farmers will lose their farms. So all those kinds of things play into not doing anything. And I think it's re a really important aspect though to look at kind of in general, and I'm no economist by any stretch of the, by any stretch of the imagination, but when you look at our GDP ratio to debt in Canada, it's actually pretty minimal. It was back in uh, 95, 96, I think the GDP ratio was something like 66%. Today, even though the government's put many programs in place around COVID and spent billions of dollars, that GDP ratio is somewhere around the 30% with some economists expecting it to maybe go as high as 36%. So we're not as bad off, you know, as we were in 95, 96, we came through that. We came through the struggles we had after the second world war here in this country where the government uh, put lots of things in place to make sure the economy was thriving and we'll get through it again this time. But, you know, um, we really have to keep reminding uh, different people about about those things that it's this isn't, you know, the, the world isn't collapsing around us, so to speak, that there are ways out of it and they need to do more to make sure workers are protected. Mm -hmm. And just... <clears throat> Uh, going back to some of the the work and and some of your actually accomplishment as uh, as as union, I think we we, we talked uh, last week a little bit about the minimum wage and and how uh, you brought changes in that. So can you talk a little bit about what 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 was that uh, struggle involved and and how you got the the, the raise in, in in minimum wage and 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 during COVID. Uh, in, in some places in Canada that uh, we saw the essential workers, their, their wage increased because those workers were required. But then we also saw that that, that increase was taken back as soon as, as the lockdowns opened. So, how, so, I mean, on one hand, we say that, okay, essential worker, we, their, 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 their work is essential and they are required and, and, and they are paid high when, 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 when we need them, but then it goes back to normal. So just talk about like what, what was the struggle in terms of the minimum wage and, and how, how, you actually, how you actually got it. Sure, so I am on the uh, Nova Scotia minimum wage committee, which is comprised of four people, uh, two business people and two labor reps. So I just wanna make it absolutely clear that I'm not speaking on behalf of that committee or for that committee. I'm speaking as an individual that believes, uh, you know, in this country, we need to at least have a $15 an hour minimum wage. 
And uh, that's been part of the struggle in my work with our committee is to make sure that we got try um, to get us there in some reasonable fashion uh, sooner than later, so to speak. We can't keep, you know, uh, hearing promises from governments over and over again that they believe we need to have this, but then uh, never get any action on that. So I think it's, um, so that work will continue. We were fortunate here in Nova Scotia that last year um, we received a dollar an hour uh, last April um, in the minimum wage and increase, which was, which was good. Uh, we need to continue to uh, push that, especially now coming out of, out of COVID that as I, you know, as I reflect back on my words a bit ago, right? The need for people to have that paycheck to be able to spend money. So those, those minimum wage workers aren't the people, you know, that are traveling down south every winter. You know, those are the people that are living and spending their money directly here in the economy and driving the economy. And the more money that they have, um, the more, you know, the more they'll spend directly uh, in the local economy. And it's just kind of, I don't want to simplify it too much, but it's just really, um, just really that's how, that's how it is. And there's lots of studies out there that, that prove that. Of course, there's always challenges from the business community who, you know, want to say, now is not the time, we can't do this now. But, you know, if we continue to listen them, to them, it will never be the time. Like it's never the right time as far as they're concerned, right? And they keep wanting to contend that businesses will shut down, you know, they'll move out. Uh, and, uh, and there's really no factual information, um, the way I look at it anyway, that really contends that it's been devastating to the economy. It just hasn't played out um, in the last three years here in Nova Scotia where minimum wage workers have seen increases of, you know, 50 and 60 cents a year. And then uh, in two years previous, I guess, I don't have the numbers right here in front of me, right off the top of my head, but, you know, in the three years I've been there, they've seen increases of 50, 60 cents kind of stuff. And then last year, uh, the dollar. So I think there's been a vast improvement over what we've generally seen uh, from that committee, which is typically you know, eight and 10 cents kind of stuff outside a few years back in the 70s where there might've been a 50 cent or 60 cent increase. So, so that work continues. The pandemic pay that you mentioned, I think that's an important thing for people need to really think about. You know, when those mostly major corporate grocery stores, uh, you know, and, and some others as well come up with a pandemic pay was really, you know, it wasn't because they were worried about their workers or that they wanted to see their workers have more. Um, they quickly removed that, that pay when, you know, COVID kind of started to subside for many people. So, you know, they gave people $2 more an hour, but I think their motive, and this is just my opinion, but I think, and many will agree, that their motive was really about being afraid that they wouldn't get enough people to come to work. So they wanted to play, you know, we're really a great employer. You're valuable to us. We really need you. So here's $2 more. And then people would come to work and they'd think they had a really great employer that was paying them more, but it was really about them trying to ensure um, they had enough workers to be able to, you know, keep the business going in COVID. So those, those, you know, major, corporate uh, food stores really did really well during COVID. They made, they pulled in, you know, higher profits during those three or four or five, six months than, than they usually, you know, have done. And then, you know, like I said, they quickly reverted back and uh, who the people that they called heroes at the start of it, soon got thrown on the trash heap and got put back in, in uh, with a lower wage again. So I think that's important. And I just want to speak for a minute directly about something that happened here in, in the city of Halifax uh, last week. There's been a number of people that have been um, challenging the provincial government, the city government in, in Halifax around a living wage. And, the, and there's been a number of, you know, the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives has done a couple of studies now about the need for a living wage and what the living wage should be in Halifax. And last week 
on the verge of a municipal election that's going to happen here in Nova Scotia on October the 17th. It's really the kind of thing that's unheard of. At the council's very last meeting, they passed a living wage ordinance that means that a number of people that now do contracting with the city are going to have to pay a living wage. I mean, there's some details in there yet that need to be worked out, but I think that's the kind of thing uh, that we need to see more of, we need to do more of, we need to support those kinds of things with more uh, municipal governments and provincial governments and even our federal government uh, around the world to make sure that people can make you know, the kind of wages that they need to make you know, to make sure their families that they have, you know, a roof over their head and they can feed their families and it's they're not just scraping by on bare minimum wage. So there is living wage standards, I guess, in every city across the globe would be able to have some economists tell them what a living wage is, which essentially at the end of the day means uh, getting people out of poverty wages and into something where at least they can provide for their family. So you answered your friend's question. Anthony was asking you this question, the difference between living wage and a minimum wage, your perspectives on that. So I think you already started to talk about that. Yeah, I think that, so the difference would be in Nova Scotia, the minimum wage is 1250 and the living wage is, you know, up to 14, 15, $16 an hour. Um, in Halifax, I think some of the, that's the sum of the wages they're going to pay some of those people um, now under those that work under those contracts. The CCPA report, it was around $20 an hour, I think, in Halifax. And I forget what the numbers were now for in, in uh, St. John, New Brunswick. But they also come up with um, a living wage for, you know, Cape Breton and other parts. I think it's important, though, too, to mention uh, to everybody that's on the webinar is that Nova Scotia is seeing increases in child poverty as an example. So while other parts of the country, child poverty is going down in Nova Scotia, it's going up and that's a serious issue. And that's part of the reason why, you know, we like to see more people um, get up to that living wage, which is higher than the minimum wage to ensure that families aren't living in poverty. It's a sad reality that, you know, in 2020, we have so much destitute and poverty, you know, in a country like Canada. And that's, that's shameful and we should be doing better and we can do better, but people need to understand the struggle and make sure that they understand that they are the change makers. Just like all of us here want to be change makers, that everybody in our society can become a change maker if they get involved. So we started to get some some questions uh, from the participants, Danny. Uh, and but before we get into it, there, there's a lot of questions around uh, talking about the future. But as a union, um, can you talk just a little bit about what are some of the contemporary issues that you are uh, dealing with? And one is obviously you talked about living uh, living wage. But uh, are there any other contemporary issues that, that that are at the focus? So what what keeps you up at the night? Well, I think, there's, I think there's lots of stuff. Like I said, over the last 25, 30 years, um, you know, things haven't um, been that great for many workers. In fact, you know, precarious work. Um, what, we've, what we've seen in, in COVID and how, you know, as an example, our seniors were treated, not just here in Nova Scotia, but right across the country, who were, you know, lived in long-term care homes where profit was the motive. And it wasn't the care of those seniors, you know, we're all going to be a senior at some point in our lives in this country. Well, pro probably all, most of us anyway, will end up, you know, possibly in a long-term care facility. So I think it's important that, you know, we continue to pick up the fight uh, for seniors in this country, that long-term care, the whole system and our home care system get moved under the Canada Health Act. Right now, they're not part of that system. So I think there's lots of work we can do around that. Our healthcare system in general is broken. So meaning our hospitals and the acute care system that we have. So there's much to do uh, around those kinds of things. Um, domestic violence and domestic violence leave, I think is, although over the last number of years, uh, many of our unions have been fighting for that. In Nova Scotia, we were successful and getting three paid days, we want it. And we came to the table with our government 
that we needed 10 paid days for anybody that's in, you know, uh, one of those um, situations that, um, you know, and the government came back with three paid days. So don't get me wrong, three days is better than what we had five years ago, which was none. But three days certainly isn't enough for somebody that's trying to get themselves out of an abusive situation, you know, where, where they can, um, you know, go see, go seek um, some guidance and some help, maybe to change their bank account or whatever, kind, whatever, whatever they need to do. Three days isn't a lot to get yourself out of that situation. So, so there's there's those kinds of things, you know, the continuation of the fight for fifteen kind of stuff. Uh, another thing that we're, that we're continue to fight for is the, those uh, paid sick days that workers need. So I think the pandemic was one of the, one of the, you know, one of the firm drivers on that, that really showed in this country that if somebody is sick and they need to stay home to look after their family, you know, that they need to have uh, sick leave. They just can, people just can't go home and stay home for 10 days and have no pay when they do that. So uh, even though the federal government, um, you know, says and talks a good story about sick days, uh, we're thankful that at least, you know, one of the political parties was, came to the table and really pushed the envelope on those paid sick days to make sure we get that. Now there's still some detail lacking that comes out of the throne speech here in this country about what the, what the details of that are. So that's why we need to continue to push for that because we get into a second wave and somebody, you know, you know, if you work in a grocery store as an example, and you have elderly parents that you live with or a family member that, that, um, that you need to kind of make sure you're looking after that you can't, and you can't go to work because you're afraid you're going to get COVID then you need to be able to access something to make sure, um, you know, others in your family aren't going to get sick and you're not going to get sick. So I think there's lots of issues around that. There's still some stuff around having proper personal protective equipment for people. Um, we'd like to see the country and, and our province move ahead uh, around, you know, our ability to be able to manufacture more Canadian products here in our country, which will create more jobs, um, you know, and uh, and childcare, um, I think is another important aspect that we've been fighting for, for a long time. And there's been government after government, federally and, and even some provincially that have been promised in childcare uh, for years. So I think that's gonna be an important aspect. That's an important aspect for many people in our economy right now who can't go back to work because they can't find uh, proper childcare that they can afford. So we need an affordable public universal childcare system in this country. So those are, those are some of the, some of the, you know, more key issues around um, some of the things that we're, that we're trying to work on. There's many, I know there's many, but, um, but I'll just, I'll touch on those few key other ones. People may raise some other ones as well, but. Yeah, yeah, no, we are starting that. Uh, Farooq, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Well, th thank you, Danny. Thank you for sharing this perspective. Um, you know, I, I, I've now made Alberta my home. I, I, I live in Calgary. And uh, like you, I was listening to the throne speech very, very carefully to see what the, the government was recommending regarding the transition towards a green or decarbonized economy. Obviously, my province is, has been driven by oil and gas. And we are concerned about uh, what may happen to the support uh, regarding the transition towards a green economy. And I know that this is something that, uh, you know, is a big issue also in Nova Scotia. In addition to coal and gas, you have a strong reliance on natural resources. What are your thoughts on, on the kind of policies and support you would like to see for workers as we transition towards this green economy? Sure. Um... You know, so green jobs to me are about, you know, the kind of thing where we can continue or manufacture, you know, products here at home um, through green jobs. So green jobs are jobs that would be better jobs, you know, jobs that pay a decent wage, jobs that provide benefits, jobs that provide a pension. So all those kinds of things, right? So those need to be jobs that 
you know, um, help improve uh, the energy kind of stuff, right? Um, and and more efficiency, um, uh, limit our greenhouse gas emissions, and minimize, you know, the waste and pollution that we have in our country. So to me, those are some of the green job, um, the kind of values behind a, a green job. But in Nova Scotia in particular, I think there's a number of things that, that we could look at if people, you know, governments get elected and then they make choices. So we need to see governments make better choices around some things. So one of the things that, you know, that I look at in Nova Scotia as an example, we lack, you know, a, a transportation network that links communities to communities. So in Nova Scotia, you know, outside Halifax, the city itself that has you know, uh, uh, buses available for people to get themselves around and in Cape Breton and down in Kentville. Essentially, if you were living in, in Yarmouth, which is the far end of Nova Scotia, and you wanted to come to Halifax or something, there is, there, there's very limited busing opportunities for you to be able to do that. So I think that's, that's part of um, some things where the government could, you know, do some good work and establish and create a network uh, to create better transportation opportunities. Maybe that could be going back to having, you know, possibly a train run around that kind of stuff. So there's, there's different things. I think the, the, the door is wide open actually for us in Nova Scotia to be able to have some discussions around what would that, what would some of those things look like? What would a green economy mean? What are the green jobs that we need? You know, we have, uh, we have wind energy, we have lots of opportunity around some of those kinds of opportunities too, to, to be able to do more around that. And I think we should, frankly, we should be doing some more around that. So it's really, you know, as much as people don't like to hear people talk about getting us off fossil fuels, but I, I think I remember a quote somewhere and I forget exactly where this came from, but it's something like for every green jobs, um, every one green job would create another seven jobs in spin-off kind of stuff. So, so I think those are important things that we need to talk about, right? And, you know, I know in Alberta and, and Newfoundland is two examples where, you know, they've become, become dependent on, you know, the oil and gas sector, but we need to really look at other ways to transition ourselves uh, out, of, out of that. Thanks, Danny. I, I, we see lots of questions in the chat, and I think it's, it's probably a good idea for us to open it up to the discussion. I mean, Yogesh and I have a whole host of other questions to ask. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to try and do this in sequence. I think, Fatima, you had a question regarding um, how the union is thinking about the future of work. Do you want to elaborate? And maybe you can quickly introduce yourself, Fatima, before you kick off. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Fatima, go ahead. Yes, so I'm Fatima. I'm working with International Labour Organization. Uh, I'm working uh, currently in Morocco. So I, I would like to, um, to, uh, to know uh, within your union, how do you think about future of work? We are uh, all of us aware about the, 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 all the change that we have in labour markets. So to save more workers, how do you how do you think in in uh, within your union? Do you have any strategy to deal with that? So it is very important to know your uh, point of view as union. And if I Thank can, you. I know that uh, um, Alison had a similar question. So maybe Alison, if you wanted to, to jump in, and then Danny can sort of respond to both because they seem to be tied. Alison. Hi. Uh, I'm doing this from my iPhone, so I don't know if you can even hear me. Can you? Yes, yes, yes I can. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I was just building on what Fatima had to say, and uh, I, I was curious as to know what Danny thinks about the impact of this COVID pandemic for the long term uh, in terms of the um, you know, structural changes in the labor force and... Um, yeah, what he's what he sees as long term implications and consequences for labor of um, of uh, all the changes that we're seeing with this pandemic. Okay, no, sure. 
Um, so I just want to mention, I see uh, Tony Tracy's on here from the, he's a Canadian Labor Congress rep uh, here in Nova Scotia. So he had mentioned that people may want to look at the Canadian Labor Congress website. So there's, there's a number of things that nationally many unions are working on. So people, you know, when, when the webinar is over, if they take a, take a look at that website, you'll see a number of things that, um, that we're working on. So um, one of the things is, was launched on Labor Day was a, a, a plan for everyone. So it's, it talks a lot about, you know, especially to the, the you know, may provide some answers to the two questions that were asked. But I think in, in Nova Scotia, we're a bit, we're a bit different because we don't have a lot of cases of COVID and we're kind of coming out of the COVID stuff, uh, not too bad off, right? So kind of restaurants and many businesses are operating at least at 50%. You know, some of them would like to see that open up to be more. We're in a bubble um, in the Atlantic region. So anybody from outside the country, when they come here, they have to self-isolate. Our cases aren't rising like they are in, in other places. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have time to relax either, right? We need to make sure that we uh, do everything we can to make sure you know, we're going to protect jobs. And that was part of the you know, government's response to help subsidize wages of people to encourage more employers to uh, keep people on the payroll kind of stuff by providing a 75% wage subsidy to many businesses. So, you know, I'm not sure how many businesses actually have taken up on that. I don't think a lot of them have, which is really shameful because um, they they could have and they should have and we would encourage that they do do that but we'll continue to do you know what we need to do here in Nova Scotia to make sure you know workers are protected um, you know I don't know I wish I had a crystal ball I don't know what the what the future is going to look like for you know COVID and what a second wave is going to look like here in Nova Scotia we certainly haven't experienced that second wave like they have in other regions. But, uh, you know, at some point, I suppose you'll see some of the economy open up to more than, you know, restaurants doing more than just 50% kind of stuff. But, but uh, you know, in the rest of the country, and that's why I suggest that if you want to take a look at what the Canadian Labour Congress is uh, talking about from a national union perspective, right, because it's different in every province, you know, in Quebec, the cases are drastically rising as they are in some other provinces. Um, but, uh, but here in Nova Scotia, it hasn't, it hasn't had a huge detrimental effect. But nonetheless, that's why we continue to fight for employment insurance and uh, better benefits for workers to make sure workers are, are looked after during, during a pandemic. And I think we have to really think about our future because if this kind of a pandemic hits us every 60, 70 years kind of stuff, like, you know, the Spanish flu, I guess would have been the, the last one, I think. Um, and now we have, now we have COVID, right? So I think we all know that we are susceptible to these things and, and that may, that may become more often than not. So, so we try to we try to manage the struggle every day based on you know what's happening at the time uh, to do what we can as a collective so you know there are federation we have uh, 23 members on our executive we have seven officers so we have you know we'll continue to have discussions around how we deal with that each of the different unions are deal with stuff sometimes um, on a different basis, you know, there's been a number of unions that represent healthcare workers, as an example, that um, did a lot of work around making sure their workers had proper personal protective equipment. Um, there's still some struggles around that. There was the struggles in the long-term care sector when hospitals get full, what happens, you know, when many of our seniors were you know, in, a, in, in at least one facility here in Halifax with two or three in a room together. So our work to try to make sure that that gets, those things get eliminated. And when we have people are in a long-term care facility, you know, there should be one person in a room and not allowed to go from floor to floor. And, 
workers, you know, were traveling possibly from one work site to another work site. So there's all, there's all those kinds of things. So I would say that typically much of stuff as it relates to COVID, COVID or any pandemic that we might have um, means that we got to be very fluid in what our response is. And, you know, I think it's, I think our part of our role is that we need to make sure that we get a message to our government that we're here because we want to work with government. We're not, we're not the enemy of government. We want to work with government and much of what you see happening around whether it's COVID or whether it's the economy or, or even going back over the last 20 years, the, the situations that many provinces or the country find themselves in are not the fault of workers. That's, you know, most of that stuff, whatever it happens to be economy related or whatever is because governments don't often want to sit down and listen to people on the front line about ways and ideas that they have on how they can kind of make things better and, and fix things. So until government wants to see uh, the trade union movement as an equal player and invite them to the table, we're going to continue to have some of these struggles. But, um, but I want people, I want to be clear with people that we're here and we want to work with our governments. We don't want to, we don't, you know, we don't want to be challenging governments all the time, but we have a constituent base that we need to represent and we're going to represent them and we're going to make sure and do the best we can to make sure that our governments are making the right choices and the right choices will be to protect workers and make sure workers, you know, uh, are not living in poverty. Thanks, Tony. If you can just maybe hone in a little bit more on Fatima's question regarding technology and how you see that sort of as a challenge in you know, displacing workers in the future. You know, you've got obviously things like um, you know, autonomous vehicles. A lot of the technology is now emerging from Nova Scotia. Any thoughts on that particular question? Well, I think I don't know. I don't know a lot about it, but some of the stuff can be quite scary. I mean, when you see things like, you know, driverless trucks, as an example. Uh, you know, I would wonder how, how people would feel about knowing that they're on the highway traveling, you know, at 100 kilometers an hour, and they have a driverless truck coming at them in February on an icy highway with two trailers on it. I mean, I don't know, so I'm not familiar with the technology, but those are the kinds of things that I think about. But I think about, you know, there is, there is some ability to do some transition between technology and, 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 you know, new technologies that come into the workplace and the transition around that. That's why, you know, again, if you want to look at the Canadian Labour Congress website around, around that transition and transitioning to green jobs and a green economy, you know, there's, so there's some stuff on that. I'm not so familiar with that, but I know, I know that there's a number of people that are very nervous around some of that technology and, and what does it mean, right? I think, I think it kind of speaks to, you know, as an example, uh, Uber has just given, been given permission, um, again, not to simplify this to, to, to too much of a degree because there are lots of complications with it, but Uber just um, was permitted by the city of Halifax to come into Halifax and operate and we, actually wrote a piece and uh, did some work around trying to promote the fact that when you have something like Uber, whether people agree or disagree about their operation, right, it's going to be devastating on the taxi industry in, the, in Halifax. And if those, if they're allowed to come in, you know, because of technology and not play by the same rules that are imposed on taxi drivers, then there's an unfairness in that, right? And it's gonna, it'll eventually mean at some point in time, you know, if taxi drivers have a different uh, parameter that they need to meet to be able to operate as a taxi, but Uber gets to come in and not have, you know, have laxer rules than taxis have, that's gonna be problematic at the end of the day and it's gonna be devastating for the taxi industry. So that's kind of, that's a bit of an example about what some of our fears are around some of that stuff. It's certainly not like uh, people may be experiencing, you know, in the oil sands in Alberta or some other places where, you know, those machinery, a driverless truck, I think is much different 
maybe in the oil sands and it would be driving down you know one of our highways where there's where people are on it but i think that's i think that's possibly where we're heading but fantastic and and i see obviously tony tracy from the canadian labor congress is with us as well obviously very active in sharing lots of amazing resources in the chat box tony can i invite you to share any thoughts or reflections if uh, if, if you have any as you've been listening to the conversation Tony, are you there? If you're trying to speak, Tony, your mic is off. You, you might need to give permission to speak there, Yogesh, or I, I don't know. He has to understand. Tony, we can't hear you. While we figure that one out, um, I wanted to see if there were any other questions. Um, what, uh, uh, Jamie has a question. Uh, Jamie, maybe you can introduce yourself and perhaps ask your question at the same time. Uh, Jamie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we can. Great, thank you so much. And uh, I think, can you hear me now is, is what everyone's saying these days over Zoom and other platforms. Uh, so hello folks, my name's Jamie Smith. I'm Director of Social Innovation with the Cody Institute and the Extension Department at St. Vex University. And uh, also executive lead with the Center for Employment Innovation. So Danny, it's very nice to have you with us today. It's nice to see you. And uh, although we've only had a few opportunities to meet over the past year, it's uh, great to listen in and to hear more about the work of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor and uh, through some of the comments that Tony's been able to bring in as well, kind of the broader dialogue around issues that are coming forward and the impacts that labor is able to bring uh, for workers and with government. So thank you very much. I, uh, much of the work that we've been engaged in over the past uh, three and a half years has focused on building a more diverse yet inclusive workforce uh, with workers here in the province. Uh, we've been engaging with Nova Scotia Works uh, through uh, our partnership with Employment Nova Scotia, with the Department of Labor and Advanced Education. Uh, and many other uh, partners across the province, like the Mi'kmaq Economic Benefits Office. We heard from Alex Paul, for example, uh, earlier in this series, um, also with the Immigrant Settlement Association of Nova Scotia, with Jennifer Watts, who was also involved very early on. I'm wondering if uh, you might be able to speak to that context of diversity, equity, and inclusion in relation to labor here in Nova Scotia and uh, any efforts or um, activities that are happening to really build more diversity within labor and uh, any comments that you might have on that as we consider that within the context of the future of work. Sure, no, and, and thanks, Jamie. I just, I just wanted to mention, I see Tony uh, now says he's, he can, he's connected and he can get on and, and the chat thing. But I wanted to mention as well, because I know we don't have time to cover everything, but when you look at some of the stuff like self checkouts and banking, and you know, I remember at one point in time when I was flying somewhere, I'd go to the airport and you could walk, you know, you'd walk up to the counter and you'd have to present your ticket. You didn't go to a kiosk machine and, and you know, kind of get yourself through the airport kind of stuff, right? But you know, the self checkout systems and the number of um, kind of stuff that's being raised about those kinds of machinery now being put into some of the, you know, grocery stores and other places. And, you know, um, how we do banking now is much different than it was 20 years ago. You know, there was no banking machines kind of stuff back I can remember in the day. So I think all those things are you know, leading to uh, that automation has led to job loss. Although some people will try to contend that people need to be technicians to, to operate those kinds of machines. I think it's important to recognize that the more that people use that, those kinds of machineries, 
the more devastating that could become on the economy. When I go to the airport, I almost always go, of course you can't now, but when, when there were people at a counter that you could go to, I would always go to the counter. I can remember, you know, one person saying to me at one point now, well, you're supposed to use a kiosk. I said, well, if I use the kiosk and continue to use the kiosk machine, then you're not going to, you're not going to have a job kind of stuff. So I think we need to think about some of those things in those kinds of, in those kinds of terms around the um, women and, and equity kind of subject line. So we're, we're working, that's a continuum that we work on. We have a women's committee, uh, we have a human rights and we have an anti-racism committee uh, here at the Federation that's doing, you know, some of that work. Many unions are doing, the, you know, very similar work and have very similar committees that do that kind of work. You know, but um, I just want to reflect on the fact that for a number of years, I guess, around uh, pay equity as an example, we've had a number of promises over the years about pay equity. And again, it goes back to these choices that government makes, right? It's nice to have a soundbite uh, from the government when they say we're going to have pay equity legislation in Canada. And uh, here it is in 2020, and we still don't have those regulations, even though it was a number of years ago, those promises have been, have been made. And I think it's really important to understand that here in Canada, the gender, what the gender gap looks like. So it's racialized, racialized women here in this country make about 40% less than a white male that was born in this country. Indigenous women are making 45% less and immigrant women are making about 55% less and women with a disability are making about 56% less. So uh, we do lots of work around, um, around you know, not just pay equity, but around um, racialized workers and the different um, aspects that they face in, in their life's work, even their inability sometimes to be able to get a job. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's really important work, but we got to up the game and we got to keep the pressure on our governments around, around those kinds of issues and, and what it means, right? We can't have an equal society until we actually have our government start making decisions that are going to lift people up and, uh, and not continue to do things to, to keep people down, so to speak. So I don't know, Jamie, if that answers your, your, your entire questions, but we do, we do try to do that work. You know, um, you know, we are working with the Aboriginal community as an example, at Alton Gas, we had them into our convention. They made a presentation, so we're trying to um, work around some of those um, indigenous problems uh, uh, around the environment and clean water, and a, and a number of those things. So um, you know, we do have some iron in the fire around uh, a, a number of those issues. We do that work through our committee. And we always get a number of resolutions at our annual convention, which is held every two years around all those subject matters. So, you know, we're working provincially and nationally around trying to make some productive change around that. So, and I just wanted to mention that even though that promise was made around uh, uh, pay equity kind of stuff, right? It's, it's really important for people to understand that in 2020, we still don't have it and that's shameful. And, you know, we need to really, we need to really think about that and think about the decisions that our government makes and do they really want to, do they really want to see change? Then we're going to have to force them to try to make that change. So. Thank you for that, Tony. Um, I'm looking at the time. I know we're just coming to the hour mark. Uh, if you can indulge us for another five minutes, uh, we wanted to just, since we have him with us. Um, Tony, I don't know whether you wanted to share a few things if you've been able to sort it out. We want to give you a few minutes to talk about it, then we'll invite Jamie to, uh, to wrap things up. Sure, much appreciated. And sorry, uh, um, you know, earlier, of course, I'm, I'm watching this, this kitchen town table, round table, literally from my kitchen table, um, but it's broadcast up to a, a television um, so I can uh, 
so I can see it. I really want to thank the Cody Institute, though, for, for this morning's important forum. Uh, I think it's, it's crucial, particularly in the context of the pandemic, and I think it's not a surprise that the pandemic and the economic crisis that has ensued has been a key component of this discussion. I think, you know, in many ways, I think we need to look back at you know, the, the, the uh, inspiration of Moses Cody, who the Cody Institute was named after um, in, in a path forward and how we need to, to look forward, um, you know, for, for what would be the future of work. And I think the future of work really, if we were to have this forum a year ago, what would be said is very, very different from what we're saying today in the midst of, of an, an attempted recovery in the context of uh, the economic crisis and the global health pandemic, of course. We need to do a number of things. We need to replace the, the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lost jobs with much better jobs. We need to, to really kickstart local economies by investing in public infrastructure. We need to invest in public services. We need you know, a made in Canada procurement strategy so that we're not um, doing procurement at the municipal, federal, um, provincial levels or hospitals or universities by, by buying things um, offshore when they can be made uh, here in Canada. We need to strengthen our, our Canadian public health care system, and this is a key aspect of the future of work, ensuring that we have um, trained health care workers in all aspects. Certainly here in Nova Scotia, we have a dramatic recruit retention issue when it comes to uh, health care workers in all avenues, whether that's uh, doctors, nurses, um, uh, LPNs, um, you know, uh, personal care workers, or any other. So we need to keep, you know, certainly seniors safe by making long-term care part of the public health care system. We saw across the country uh, and across North America certainly a massive difference in in people's lives, like literally um, in life and death differences between private nursing homes private um, um, uh, for-profit long-term care facilities and public nursing homes that are unionized. Um, unionized public, uh, and unionized and public long-term care facilities had 48% lower death rates throughout the, the course of the pandemic from, from March um, until the summer. Um, it, 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 those numbers uh, are as of about mid-July. I haven't seen any uh, much change in those numbers subsequently, but we need to make also make, to help families, you know, really make ends meet by adding prescription drugs to Canada's healthcare system. That's one of the things the Congress is is working towards um, at this point is having a national pharmaceutical um, uh, plan, a, a a national pharmacare plan that's universal and has you know anyone who has a health card should be able to just go into a a, a pharmacy, a drugstore, and be able to obtain their medications at no cost. It's, it's the third plank of our um, Medicare system and we need to have. And this is a, a, a key question around work as well, because for workers, if you look at what the costs are, pharmaceutical plans, you know, it's, it's one of the driving costs um, that, that's um, driving our, our it's, it's a 12% annual escalator uh, for our healthcare system in terms of pharmaceutical costs. It's, it's a, a major escalator in terms of the, the uh, our ability to bargain better uh, wages. It, it actually, you know, it hinders our ability to bargain better wages because we're constantly trying to keep up with uh, with coverage and so forth. We need a national plan. And we also need to disaster proof our entire country with a, a, a safety net for Canadians. Um, we're going to have another economic disaster. You know, there's no question um, we're seeing um, a, a second wave in most provinces. We're very lucky in the Atlantic region uh, where, where I live and work. Um, certainly for a number of reasons, you know, mandatory masking legislation in Nova Scotia, um, you know, travel restrictions and other things. But we are going to see a second wave. We're going to see, um, you know, a next economic disaster at some point. We need to make sure that employment insurance is there for everybody who needs it. There's been some massive changes to employment insurance in the uh, throne speech. We need to further those and, and retain these changes as well beyond the next year. Uh, we need a plan for child care. Child care is, is so key in terms of dream jobs. Um, you know, Danny was talking about some of the, the escalators in, in, in terms of investments. For every dollar that's invested in child care, child care alone, $10 comes back to the local community, right? So we, we need a national child care plan. And we're seeing, you know, discussion of that finally by the federal liberals, although I have to admit the first time I heard about a national child care plan from another federal liberal government was 31 years ago. And I can say that with certainty, my daughter's 30. Uh, it was announced 31 years ago, there'd be a national childcare plan. You know, uh, she's now 30. And of course there still is not such a plan. So we, we need to further that and make sure that that, that happens. 
and we need affordable housing for all. And, and build, building affordable housing puts people to work. That's a, a job creation and green economy um, thing as well. So, you know, th that's a few short thoughts um, of what we're looking at in terms of Canada's unions uh, from coast to coast to coast in the Canadian Labour Congress. And thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. You, you crammed in a lot of stuff in a couple of minutes there, Tony. Um, we, we may invite both you and Danny back in the, in, in the session, perhaps in, in, a, in a few weeks when we are talking a little bit about the role of government and education institutions and indeed the unions in pushing some of this forward. So we'll try and reconnect uh, regarding all of this.